Greetings to everybody. Um, this is the Sam Hughes Lecture, which of course is dedicated to Sol Schneider and is a version of the lecture that is given at SOAP's annual meeting each year. Um, it is a little bit different of a type of lecture than other lectures that you will receive or have received, and anyone who's been to this meeting before knows that it covers a broad range, a, a broad array of topics. I, of course, have no conflicts of interest. This set of topics is basically the entirety of the literature uh, associated with obstetric anesthesia or something that the obstetric anesthesia provider might be interested in. And um, it is a review of about 84 journals throughout the entire year of 2015. 40,000 different titles within those journals, all summarized into one little lecture. And what I chose to do is to carry through that lecture a stream of consciousness so that we can kind of appreciate what happened in 2015 and its place in the literature of obstetric anesthesia. It starts with maternal mortality, morbidity, goes to cesarean delivery, travels through obstetric hemorrhage, and then the effects of anesthesia, which was a topic that was slightly brought up earlier this morning. Sprinkled throughout will be a few lessons on patient safety, and we have to keep in mind patient safety is ultimate consideration for all of us. Diving right into maternal mortality and morbidity, the good news over the past 60 years or so, 70 years, was that the maternal mortality had been going down consistently for all causes throughout the, the past 60, 70 years. But something happened in 1985 that was very concerning, and that's that maternal mortality started to go up. And it's been going up consistently since then, and no one understood why. So I read with great interest this paper by uh, Krienga looking at pregnancy-related mortality in the United States from 2006 to 2010. It covers the CDC's Pregnancy Mortality Surveillance System, which was an, is an augmented surveillance system, and looks at all maternal death within one year of termination of pregnancy, which is different than what the World Health Organization data uses, something we'll look at a little bit later. There's a 10-category cause of death coding that looks only at maternal uh, pregnancy-related maternal mortality as opposed to pregnancy-associated, which they consider uh, uh, suicide, which, of course, uh, John pointed out is the largest cause of death in pregnancy. During that five-year period, there were 21 million births in the United States, and of that, there were 3,300 pregnancy-related deaths which comes to a maternal mortality ratio of about 16 deaths per 100,000 live births. 86.5% of those were within the 42-day World Health Organization data, which should give us a ratio of about 13.6 uh, deaths per 100,000 live births. The World Health Organization actually gives us a number closer to 30, which has to do with their fudge factors and how they decide to alter countries' rate, uh, numbers. There were some disturbing things inside of uh, this report. The most significant one was the significant disparity in outcomes of the non-Hispanic black population that had a maternal mortality ratio 2.3 times higher than other races and ethnicities. And it's not just mortality that is affected by ethnicity, it's also morbidity in the study looking at racial and ethnic disparities in maternal morbidity and obstetric care. This was part of a collaborative between the NICHD and the maternal, uh, medicine, maternal fetal medicine unit network, which covered 25 hospitals over four years prospectively. Collected here was 110,000 deliveries. You can see the racial divide uh, in those patients that were being taken care of. And what they found was that for every morbidity that they examined, including severe postpartum hemorrhage, peripartum infection, and perineal laceration, there was a significant racial disparity present. And remember, these are the same hospitals, same physicians, same nurses, all taking care of these patients. And yet, there were significant racial disparities. Here you can see a second uh, disturbing trend that is that with the 
increasing age of the average population of the parturient, in other words, as women delay their childbirth uh, years until older age, there's a significant contribution of advanced maternal age such that one in four deaths is associated with AMA in the current report, which you can see also significantly affected the non-Hispanic black population. The only good news was that the relative contribution of hemorrhage, preeclampsia, and pulmonary embolism, which were the big three killers in previous historical reports, all decreased. But as nature abhors a vacuum, the relative contribution of maternal cardiovascular conditions, uh, cardiomyopathy, and non uh, med non-cardiovascular medical conditions, including obesity, all increase significantly such that they now cause half of all, cardi of all maternal deaths. What does this mean? What this means is that compared to 1987, when the first augmented report was published, Things that women died from, the majority of things women died from, were things that they acquired when they became pregnant, whereas now women are dying from things that they have prior to becoming pregnant, and these are things that can be much more resistant to treatment because they already have them and they tend to get worse during pregnancy. For example, we know that women with cardiovascular congenital heart disease have significantly worse outcomes. In this study uh, by Thompson, 6% significant cardiovascular outcomes, and moreover, they had worse outcomes if they had pulmonary hypertension compared to women without pulmonary hypertension and congenital heart disease. Similarly, women with peripartum cardiomyopathy have a very high morbidity, including 2% mortality and 6% overall uh, morbid events. And women with pre-existing coronary artery disease or following acute coronary syndrome, which is becoming more common as people are older in pregnancy, have 10% adverse uh, maternal events and 50% adverse fetal events. Think about that. 50% of their babies are affected, most of that by preterm birth. In this study looking at pregnancy-related mortality in California, what the authors did was not only had the data, just collected data, dry data, but they also had a panel which reviewed the data in a, in a uh, consistent fashion in order to determine whether or not there was a good to strong likelihood that the patient could have survived. And what they found was that overall, 41% of maternal deaths had a good to strong likelihood of being prevented, especially if those women died from hemorrhage or from preeclampsia was 70 and 60 percent respectively. However, if a woman died from a cardiovascular condition, there was a very low likelihood that they were going to be salvaged. What this means is that our patients are older and they have more complex medical histories. The challenge is how do we care for these patients? Because if we continue to do the same thing, we're going to continue to have the same outcomes, right? So let's look at a little patient safety minute here. And this is one as a guideline. And it comes from all the way back in 1975, where the March of Dimes uh, authored a publication called Toward Improving Outcome of Pregnancy, in which they called for a system of integrated regionalized perinatal care. And this did lead to the neonatal uh, system of care, where we have three levels of NICU. And this has been demonstrated to improve outcomes in premature babies, especially. Well, uh, in 2015, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and SMFM uh, published the levels of maternal care. And what this document asks for is a distribution of regionalized care where there are level one uh, care, which is a birth center or a routine care or that take care of uncomplicated pregnancies and have the ability to stabilize and transfer patients to higher level care. And anesthesia services must be available for uh, labor analgesia or surgical anesthesia. Level two care are specialized centers that can care for some high-risk patients such as preeclampsia or, or morbidity or placenta previa. And anesthesia services must be available at all time with a board-certified obstetric specialized anesthesiologist, but only available for consultation. 
so other, pa other providers can care for these patients. And finally, level three and level four care for the most complex, critically ill patients. The goal here is to shunt the more complex, higher risk patients into higher level care so that the systems to develop their care and to make sure that they are cared for in the best, most efficient, most effective fashion are centralized in certain high risk centers. Anesthesia services in those centers have to be run by a board certified anesthesiologist specialized in obstetric anesthesia and in charge of the obstetric anesthesia services. And if we are to change care in those centers and other centers, we have to look at what we do in these centers. And one of the places you need to start is with the tip of the iceberg, which would be patients admitted to the intensive care center. In this study, looking at pregnancy-related ICU admissions in France, looked at a five-year period, and what they collected was data from all patients admitted to the ICU in France, a hospital data, a nationwide database. Overall, there were almost 12,000 pregnancy-related ICU admissions during that period, which comes to a number about 3.6 per thousand deliveries. In that admission, half of all admissions were due to hemorrhage and hypertensive disorders such as preeclampsia. However, those patients had very low case fatality ratios, meaning they were likely to be taken care of and transferred out of the ICU in a somewhat healthy condition, as opposed to patients who had admissions because of amniotic fluid embolism and anesthesia complications who had some of the highest case fatality ratios in this study. Similar in infectious diseases, which would be sepsis, which remains one of the leading causes of maternal mortality. The death ratio from uh, sepsis has not changed throughout the course of study over year, over year, over year. And this study looking at uh, sepsis specifically in the state of Michigan uh, looked at maternal deaths from the period 1999 to 2006. They used data from the uh, maternal mortality surveillance system from the state of Michigan and identified sepsis with standardized coding systems. And what they found was that in the state of Michigan during that uh, period, there were 558 maternal deaths, which comes to a ratio of 14 per 100,000 live births, which is very similar to the rest of the country. So this is a representative sample, at least from that perspective. Overall, 15% of all pregnancy-related deaths were directly caused by sepsis in that study period, coming for 2.1 deaths per 100,000 live births. Further, 25% of maternal pregnancy-related deaths were complicated by sepsis. So even though they died primarily from something else, they became septic during that period of time. This is one of the leading contributors to maternal mortality. When they looked at the individual cases, they found that the majority had uh, inadequate care defined as delayed identification, delayed treatment, or inadequate antibiotic coverage, suggesting that we could do better and one of the ways outside of obstetrics that people try to identify patients who are septic, who are likely to benefit from earlier identification is the early warning uh, system. This modified early warning system, which is used uh, in many centers, includes a lot of uh, vital signs in order to identify patients who are likely to become severely septic in the near future so that you can bring resources to see the patient and try to abort the patient, abort the, the septic episode and administer antibiotics early, which is really the key to treating sepsis. Unfortunately, in pregnancy, the physiologic changes mean that many pregnant patients already trigger under the system, which when studied, the modified the early warning uh, modified early warning system performs very pregnancy very poorly in pregnancy with a positive predictive value less than two percent, which means you would have to identify fifty patients to catch one, which is very very poor. Many centers, because of this, have developed obstetric focused versions or simply called modified obstetric early warning systems or meows. And these were studied in the study looking at validation of diagnostic performance for severe sepsis in women with chorioamnionitis. And what the authors did was they collected six meows and compared them to uh, traditional mews, 
In their database, they had 900 patients with chorioamnionitis and five patients with severe sepsis. And what they found, cutting to the chase, was that there was very low positive predictive value of all six of the meows, and none of them performed any better than the standard modified early warning system, suggesting that vital signs alone are not going to be sufficient to identify pregnant women who become septic. We will have to identify some other method of capturing these patients and being able to treat them. Brings us to cesarean delivery. And in uh, 1985, the World Health Organization declared that there was no justification for any region to have a cesarean delivery rate higher than 10 to 15 percent. They did so with data which was outdated at the time, and modern obstetric care and modern patients are very different than what they were using to justify that number. And so this study by Molina looked at the relationship between cesarean delivery rate and maternal and neonatal mortality. And what they collected was the 194 World Health Organization member states, of which you can see here some collected active data, some they had to use historical data and estimate current numbers, and some they just kind of imputed from local, social, and uh, financial data of the country. Overall, there were about 76 countries that they felt they had good data, reliable data. During 2012, there were 23 million cesarean deli deliveries estimated to have happened in the World Health Organization states worldwide. And when they looked at the data, they found that the maternal mortality rate decreased as the cesarean delivery rate increased until they reached a number somewhere around 19 to 20 percent cesarean delivery rate. Similarly, the neonatal mortality rate decreased. Fewer babies died as the cesarean delivery rate increased until they reached a number somewhere between 19 and 24 percent when they used only the high quality data, suggesting that a higher cesarean delivery rate, at least up to 19 or 24 percent, is beneficial in terms of neonatal and maternal mortality. Why do we as obstetric anesthesia providers care? Well, we know that the majority of anesthesia associated mortality is uh, associated with cesarean delivery. Failed airway, despite decades of talking about it, still occurs in about 1 in 250 parturients. But mortality from anesthesia has consistently decreased over the decades. Whether this is due to improved practice or equipment is unclear. We can talk about a lot of different reasons, but it's one of the primary reasons why anesthesiologists, anesthesia providers prefer regional anesthesia over general anesthesia for care of their patients, including um, the, the profile of side effects of regional anesthesia are much preferred compared to general anesthesia for pregnant women, and finally the ability of the family or, or other patient, or other people to participate, especially the patient to participate in a delivery of their offspring. This study uh, looked at maternal and fetal outcomes following unplanned conversion to general anesthesia at elective cesarean delivery because sometimes general anesthesia is necessary. It was a single center study looking only at non-emergent cases, so times when they had the ability to give a regional anesthetic, but for some reason the patient needed a general anesthetic. Overall, there were 4,300 deliveries over the uh, period from 2008 to 2013, and they identified each case that needed to be converted gen to general anesthesia. The rate at their center was 3.8 percent. Looking at the type of neuraxial anesthesia that was provided, it was clear that epidural anesthesia failed 11 percent of the time and needed to be converted to general anesthesia. Now, these were most likely cases of labor that had to go to C-section, and we know that it can be very difficult at times to take a patient from labor who's having a very prolonged, difficult labor and go to C-section and raise epidural anesthesia. So this is probably the majority of these cases. However, regardless of the cause of general anesthesia, it was associated with delayed neonatal respiration and increased maternal blood loss during the operation. So let's take a patient safety minute and look at the obstetric airway. This 
publication by the Obstetric and Anesthetist Association and Difficult Airway Society looked at management guidelines for difficult airway and uh, failed tracheal intubation and obstetrics, and it was the first evidence-based airway publication specific to the obstetric patient. They published three algorithms. The first algorithm looked at safe obstetric general anesthesia and really focuses on the unit, so getting your unit ready for provision of general anesthesia, getting the patient ready for provision of general anesthesia, and making sure that you have the equipment, training, and personnel and practices to, make, to provide safe care. It carries up until the failed uh, uh, second intubation attempt, and then the second algorithm is on the failed trach intubation attempt and uh, what to do in that situation, and then the third algorithm is the dreaded can't ventilate, can't intubate situation. I recommend reading this publication because it has five great charts that are easily printed, put in your pocket, put in the drop, top drawer of the anesthesia machine, put on the walls as posters. These are very educational things that we should always have in the mind because this is a real constant situation we all face, of course. But if we're talking about visual aids like those posters, my favorite visual aid from 2015 was this one from the pediatric literature looking at the impact of novel decision support tool on the adherence of neonatal resuscitation. And what the authors developed was a, uh, a computer pad that not only collected the vital signs of the baby, but also created an algorithm uh, prompting situation. So as they were doing resuscitation, it would prompt what they needed to do next. Trained resuscitated teams in simulated environments were more able to follow published guidelines in two different scenarios whenever they use this visual aid. I call this active visual aid. Imagine if you had on your vi uh, video laryngoscope something that told you what to do next in the difficult airway situation, or imagine if you had in your resuscitation program when you had to draw labs, when you had to give this program, or what other things you needed to do. Imagine if our visual aids actually spoke to us and helped us out along the way. So how are we doing in cesarean delivery? This study looked at the temporal trends of anesthesia-related adverse events in the state of New York from 2003 to 2012 and looked at 785 cesarean deliveries based on hospital discharge records. And what they found was that anesthesia-related adverse events occurred in about 730 per 100,000 cesarean deliveries. However, as a trend, that rate was decreasing over that 10-year period consistently, and this occurred in every single hospital subgroup they looked at, regional uh, medical centers, rural medical centers, teaching, and private hospitals. So every group anesthesia-related related events were going down, whereas the non-anesthesia events were increasing in each and every one of those centers. More importantly, the anesthesia-related events that they looked at 94% of them were considered minor events, half of those being uh, post puncture headache, and the major events, only 6%, included things that had a mortality risk of greater than 1%. On the other hand, the non-anesthesia events that were increasing in, in frequency throughout this period of time included everything that you never want to be diagnosed with. If we do look at anesthesia-related events, the most common thing for cesarean delivery, of course, is hypotension. Low blood pressure occurs very commonly during cesarean delivery under spinal anesthesia, and if you open up every textbook, it talks about aortocalvo compression, which is in part caused by supine hypotension syndrome and occurs in about 10 to 15 percent of our parturients and not only causes maternal decrease in blood pressure, but potentially a decrease in fetal perfusion. This is the foundation for lateral tilt. Always debated is how much tilt is required. I know there's a talk later uh, on this specific subject, but this study looked at the effect of lateral tilt uh, angle on the volume of abdominal, abdominal aorta uh, and fear of vena cava in pregnant and non-pregnant women. There were 10 healthy parturients who are term pregnant and 10 healthy volunteers, and MRI was performed at four 
positions of tilt, and that included 0, 15, 30, and 45 degrees. The abdominal and uh, aortic vena cava uh, were cut at L2334 with about 120 uh, MRI cuts in order to assess the volume in those great vessels. Here you can see the non-pregnant patient volunteer. And the vena cave on the left and the aorta on the right are pretty much identical at zero and 30 degree tilt. However, you can see in the term parturient that the vena cava at, at full supine position is basically obliterated and comes to uh, full filling similar to the pre-pregnancy uh, value at about 30 degrees, which was the ideal tilt in this study. What was interesting is that despite that picture, the cardiac output, mean arterial pressure, and heart rate were all similar at all four degrees of tilt in the pregnant population. We do have to remember, however, none of these patients had a spinal anesthetic. Patients who had confirmed supine hypotension syndrome were excluded from the study, so the patients that we might have worry about were actually excluded from the study. And finally, they did not measure fetal perfusion. I think everyone in this room can agree with me that hypotension is potentially bad. Fluids, despite about 150 different studies, have proven to be very ineffective as the sole means of preventing hypotension after spinal anesthesia. Ephedrine, which was the, the sole agent anyone could use for decades, was associated with maternal tachycardia and found to also be associated with a fetal acidosis, which is mild and of questionable clinical significance. Phenylephrine became the mainstay over the past 10 to 15 years and is associated with a maternal bradycardia and a decrease in cardiac output, which again is of questionable clinical significance. But that led to this study looking at a randomized double-blind comparison of norepinephrine and phenylephrine for maintenance of blood pressure during spinal anesthesia for cesarean delivery. The study looked at 104 parturients scheduled for cesarean delivery. Standard spinal anesthesia, including cohydration and hip wedge, were used. Patients were randomized nor norepinephrine or phenylephrine after initiation of spinal anesthesia, and they used an, a computer-controlled closed feedback loop, uh, closed loop feedback system. I warn you, you cannot re replicate this by hand. Right? You can't do it on your infusion pump. This is a computer-controlled software in order to adjust the infusion. Their primary outcome was cardiac output. On the top panel, what you can see is that the blood pressure was maintained pretty consistently with both drugs to an equal degree. On the bottom panel, what you can see is the average heart rate on, among women who received phenylephrine during the course of the first 20 minutes was lower than that of norepinephrine. There was also a much higher rate of maternal bradycardia, 58% versus 12% uh, in the norepinephrine group. When they looked at their primary, primary outcome of cardiac output, what they saw is that the average cardiac output among women who received norepinephrine was higher than, that was, than those women who received phenylephrine. I put this blue line into this chart just to identify the normalized baseline cardiac output. And the question here is, without knowing the safety features of norepinephrine, what is the implication of having a higher than uh, normal cardiac output in these patients? And we don't know the answer to that. My, one of my favorite papers for uh, cesarean delivery looked at postpartum care. And this was a study looking at the introduction of enhanced recovery for elective cesarean delivery, enabling next day discharge. What the authors did, uh, did was take lessons from other services, such as cardiac surgery, colorectal, et cetera, where fast tracking these patients or having a pathway for care that is followed by all patients uh, actually has been shown to reduce morbidity and improve faster recovery in these patients, allowing early discharge and early faster recovery. They put in a number of uh, changes over the course of a short period of time, and from the anesthesia perspective, this included carb loading two hours prior to surgery, so his patients were actually taking sugar drinks two hours before surgery, active warming, spinal uh, long-acting dimorph, which would be uh, what they use in the UK, 
early feeding. So they fed these patients immediately post-op and early mobilization, get them up and, uh, and moving. And over the course of four years, they got up to one quarter of patients having discharge on the first post-operative day. What they, when they went back and looked in the third year, what they found was that patients who were discharged on post-op day one or post-op day two actually had very low rates of readmission. Now, to some extent, this makes sense, right? If a patient's having a diff difficult post-operative course, they're going to stay longer, they're going to be more likely to be readmitted. So I'm not saying this is the be-all, but it's very encouraging to see that they weren't pushing patients out of the hospital and having them bounce back. And this is, I think, something that we could actually improve our post-operative care by getting patients out of our MRSA VRE-laden hospitals. So let's take a look at a patient safety minute. This one looks at guidelines and asks whether the presence of condition-specific guidelines or protocols leads to detectable improvements in post-operative uh, care. Again, the uh, NICHD MFMU uh, cooperative, and they instituted during their study three protocols on hemorrhage, preeclampsia, and shoulder dystocia. And what they found was that there was absolutely no difference in outcome, no difference in morbidity. They couldn't find a single detectable meaningful difference by instituting guidelines, which means that it's not just having a protocol or having a guideline, but how you institute it, how you teach people to use it, how you make sure that everything is being tailored to the local environment. Those are the important parts about guidelines and protocols. And so if we're going to look at our protocols, let's start with the top one on maternal hemorrhage and looking at the prevention and management of postpartum hemorrhage with a comparison of four national guidelines. These guidelines come from the US, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, covering the, basically the entire English-speaking world, which means they had access to the exact same literature, and yet the number of references for these guidelines ranged from 12 to 110. National experts got together and published these things, and when they did, they had very little use of randomized control trials or meta-analysis. In fact, the ACOG document is basically an expert opinion piece. There were very few points of agreement, and when we look at those points of agreement, we see that one, clinical markers should be used over visual guesstimates of blood loss, which we all know already, right? We're not very good at, at predicting blood loss based on what we look at. Active management of third stage was in agreement along with the medications. This is one of my favorites. Surgical or interventional radiology should be used after you try medications. That's great. And units should have resuscitative equipment. Now think about the hundreds, if not thousands, of hours these experts put together, and this is what they came up with in agreement. And finally, that internal iliac balloons are of equivocal nature and accreta, which brings us to our next topic, which is obstetric hemorrhage, specifically placenta accreta. And this study uh, looked at the morbidity associated with cesarean delivery in the United States, asking whether accreta has become an increasing source of morbidity using the nationwide inpatient sample, which covers about 20% of all U.S. discharges. They found that there was a gradual increase over the 12 years of this study of both primary and repeat cesarean delivery. When looking at uh, complications or, uh, of cesarean delivery, there was a significant increase in the incidence of blood transfusion, renal failure, and shock in these patients over this 12-year period due to cesarean delivery. Similar to data from New York, there was a decrease in the incidence of anesthesia complications and also maternal mortal, uh, mortality. However, when looking specifically at placenta accreta, what the authors found was that for repeat cesarean delivery only, there was a significant increase in the incidence of placenta accreta, such as it is now one in 750 deliveries in the United States. This is the consequence of having a higher cesarean delivery rate. And if we talk about obstetric hemorrhage, we have to talk about resuscitation. Yesterday, there was a lot of comments made about resuscitation practices. And, and just to cover it a little more clearly, the whole blood is a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. 
for decades after the uh, Red Cross split blood products, the standard practice at many centers had been to use a one to one to two red cell heavy transfusion practice. In retrospective and battlefield studies, this was found to be associated with a higher mortality in resuscitated teams compared to a whole blood, similar whole blood ratio of one to one to one. There was some discussion or some concern that this was biased by what's called survivor bias, means you have to survive long enough to get the FFP, which needs to be thawed, brought to you in order to achieve a one-to-one -one ratio. So people who die early in a traumatic episode are more likely to remain at a one-to-one-to-two -one -to ratio. So that would be people who survive can get to the one-to-one. -one. That's survivor bias. So I read with great interest the results of the proper trial, which compared in a prospective fashion one-to-one-to-one to one-to-one-to-two -one -to -one -to -one -to ratio uh, in severe patients with severe trauma. This was a multi site randomized study that started in the ambulance. So when the, they called in a trauma, the patient was, uh, the blood bank would send up a sealed container and they would, had strict criteria for inclusion and exclusion of these patients. Once the patient met inclusion criteria, the, the seal was broken and the patient was randomized. And then they had strict criteria for transfusion of the patient until the hemorrhage was terminated or the patient died. And here you can see what each of the boxes had on the left, the one to one to one ratio, whole blood ratio, had platelets in the first pack, six of uh, FFP and six of red cells were in the one to one to two ratio, the standard ratio, platelets were provided in the second pack and every other case after that. There was no difference in primary outcomes, and the primary outcomes were mortality in the first 24 hours or 30-day mortality. This was a negative study from that perspective. There were some differences in a couple of features, one which was that there was a little bit of catch-up that was needed after the first resuscitative episode in the patients who got the one-to-one-to-two -one -to -two ratio. So they needed additional FFP and cryoprecipitate after the initial episode for uh, derangements of their clotting profiles. However, there was no difference in mortality associated with that. There was a higher death rate in the first hour among patients in the one to one to two ratio. So those patients were more likely to exsanguinate and to die of their traumatic episode in the first hour in that group. It was about 20 patients. I'm not sure that one bag of platelets made all that difference. So I think that that is uh, just a randomization error that occurred in this study. What exactly this study's results apply to obstetric hemorrhage can be questioned. First of all, pregnant patients are in a degree of consumptive coagulopathy as soon as they start uh, delivery. So as soon as the placenta separates from the uterus, they're in a consumptive coagulopathy similar to DIC. Secondly, there's usually only one organ as opposed to traumatic patients that can have multiple injuries, and sometimes the surgeons are unable to find those injuries as they go along. So the surgical times are usually shorter in obstetrics. There's a lack of predictive nature in obstetrics. Usually we discover we're in a hemorrhage or we're going to have a hemorrhage when we're deep in it, whereas the ambulance was calling them many minutes before they were going to start here. And finally, there's a question of acute lung injury associated with transfusions which became popular a few years ago, causing a change in how our blood uh, uh, Red Cross collects and, and uh, uh, sends out FFP plasma, which was studied in this study by Clifford looking at the epidemiology of postoperative transfusion-related acute lung injury. And what they did was they collected uh, at their center all surgeries who received transfusions, and they found that overall the rate of uh, transfusion-related acute lung injury was 1.3 percent for all surgeries, all comers. They had zero cases in obstetrics and gynecology, which made me feel better, and then I decided foolishly to calculate the 95 percent confidence intervals, which came out to the top end of 1.3. So we may not actually be out of the woods. Our patients may still be at risk for transfusion-related acute lung injury. Brings us to our final topic, the effects of anesthesia as, uh, association or causality. Or I like to subtitle this, 
A does not equal B. I'm going to start with a study that was very disturbing when I read it. This is the morphologic features of neonatal brain following exposure to regional anesthesia during labor and delivery. This study included 37 healthy infants, and they uh, all had or were supposed to have MRIs two weeks post-delivery. The distribution was their moms either had no anesthesia, spinal anesthesia for C-section, or epidural anesthesia for labor uh, and delivery. They also followed up with behavioral testing at 12 months. This was part of a larger study that was looking at patients who were having behavioral testing afterwards. Now, there were three regions of the brain that this study looked at, and that is the frontal occipital and parietal lobes. And the important part of these areas of the brain is that those areas actually decrease in volume as they organize in the post-delivery period. So by two weeks, the volume in those areas should be less. And that is supposed to be associated with better behavioral testing at 12 months. What the authors found was that when they looked at the comparison between mothers who had no anesthesia and mothers who had any type of neuraxial anesthetic, there was larger volume in each of those three regions than uh, women who had no anesthesia. What this means is that neuraxial anesthesia was associated with greater volume in areas of the brain that are supposed to decrease in volume in the first two weeks. Furthermore, when they looked at patients who had epidural anesthesia for epidural analgesia for labor, they found that there was an apparent time response or dose response relationship with the size of the brain in the first two weeks so that ba uh, babies whose mother had epidural anesthesia for a longer period of time had less shrinkage in those regions, which isn't supposed to happen. And finally, that even women who had spinal anesthesia, their babies were born with brain sizes that were not shrinking the way that babies who had no anesthesia. Despite the fact that there was no association with anesthesia in their testing and behavioral testing at 12 months, the author spent the majority of the discussion in this paper talking about the effects of anesthesia basically causing brain damage. Think about that. Now, there are a lot of problems with this study, and I'm not going to support that this is real. First problem is that there were variations in the age, gestational age of the actual babies. So that there were actually some premature babies being born in the anesthesia group that weren't in the no anesthesia group. So that was one major difference. Another was that there was significant variation in that two weeks of MRI, where some of them got it at one week and some at actually six weeks. And there were significant differences, enough that you could say that the study probably isn't going to prove exactly what it wants to prove if it were a larger study. But this is a major concern that we may actually be causing something. But if the history of obstetric anesthesia says nothing, it did teach us that A does not equal B. Women who request epidural analgesia are not the same as those who are, have an unmedicated birth. There are significant measured and unmeasured factors that can lead to selection bias. Similarly, women who need to have a cesarean delivery are not the same as those who can have a vaginal delivery. There can be significant variables, measured or unmeasured, that can lead to selection bias, right? Epidurals don't cause C-section. This is the same argument over and over. But we do have to be concerned, and the FDA declared that we have to be concerned over the drugs and medications and techniques that we do on the developing brain, because we do know that there can be significant impacts. I'm going to show you one. This study looking at spatial working memory and attention skills as predicted by maternal stress during pregnancy. We know that if you take rats and you give mom rat stress during pregnancy, the offspring, the litter, has spatial learning and memory deficits that can be measured uh, in the lab. Whether this occurs in humans or not was unknown. This study looked at women who were enrolled in the second trimester, um, and they had validated scores looking at stressful life events in the second trimester. They also interviewed the women for uh, recent life events at 18 months. They did the Edinburgh 
uh, postnatal depression scale and the state trait uh, anxiety inventory. They also took the kids and did testing on them at 6, 18, and 48 months. And what they found was that not mom's stress or any other characteristic at 18 months of life of the, neo, of the, of the baby, but mom's stress in the second trimester of pregnancy was associated with attention-shifting negative behavior in the offspring at 18 months of life, which means that mom's life events during pregnancy significantly affect infant spatial working memory at 18 months. So things we do can affect the baby, and we know that in the lab at least, if you give sevoflurane to mice, that, that affects a long-term learning impairment in those, uh, in those animals. Similarly, if you give propofol to rats before seven days or at seven days when they're pups or when they're very young, that it actually causes apoptosis in the thalamus and the cortex. But if you give propofol to rats who are at 14 days, so after they've reached some degree of adolescence, it's actually protective in those same regions. So there's something that is special about the immature brain that can be at risk to these drugs. For example, if you take women who are taking chronic opioids, morphine in this study by Steinhorn, that you can measure behavioral differences in those kids up to two years of life. So there's something about that, that vulnerable stage and Zhang looked at association between childhood exposure to single general anesthesia and neurodevelopment. This was a meta-analysis, a review of meta-analysis, and any time you have a meta-analysis, you have to put up a forest chart, which basically summarizes all these studies and the impact, and the diamond on the bottom is the summary clue that says there is about an 18% impact of a single general anesthetic before the age of three or four on subsequent neurodevelopmental behavioral testing at 12 months. Now, I'm pretty sure that like you, my pediatric anesthesia colleagues aren't running out on the street and giving random kids general anesthesia. So kids who need surgery are not the same as kids who don't need surgery, right? A does not equal B. There are measured or unmeasured variables that can impact these differences and cause selection bias. So there has to be some appreciation that this is not randomized studies. There are differences. Continued research is going to be needed. This is just at the early stage, but it's something that our patients are and will be asking us about, so we have to be prepared to understand and, and discuss. Another hot topic, pun intended, is epidural fever. Someone got that right? Okay, just checking. We know that infection can cause maternal fever, and we know that there is an association between use of epidural analgesia in labor and higher temperatures in labor. Those are indisputable facts. We know that infection, of course, can cause neonatal brain injury, and I showed you, uh, and some authors have said that uh, by having a fever that it can actually cook the baby's brain and lead to neurologic injury. And I showed you a paper that suggests that even epidural analgesia can cause brain damage. And we know that women who come in with chorioamnionitis are in greater pain and more likely to ask for epidural anesthesia. And women who have epidural anesthesia, some authors have argued that it prolongs labor so much that they get infected and that can lead to infection. And then there's this entire concept of sterile inflammation that the inflammatory process that's developed either because of epidurals or in labor can actually increase the likelihood of having fever if you have an epidural. And my experience over time is that if you have a chart that looks like this, it just means we have no idea what we're talking about yet. Last 2015, we had some studies that helped shed some light on this. One came from uh, Neil that looked at the differences in inflammatory markers between nulliparous women admitted to hospitals in preactive versus active labor. So these are patients who came in in either pre-active labor, so before they were acti actually in labor, and the authors collected CR markers, and what they found was that women who had inflammatory biomarkers were those who were in active labor. And the longer they were in labor, the higher the serum inflammatory markers became. Basically, labor is an inflammatory process. Labor is inflammation. 
So the longer you're in labor, the longer your inflammatory markers go up. The association between inflammation and epidural anesthesia is logical, not causative. Second study looked at the inflammatory predictors of neurologic disability. So does inf inflammation, uh, is it associated with neurologic disability after preterm premature rupture of membranes? And what the authors found was that inflammatory markers only found in mom's serum were not associated with uh, neurologic injury or disability. However, if those inflammatory markers were drawn from the amniotic fluid in this preterm uh, premature rupture of membranes, that was associated with neurologic injury, which means the inflammation has to be on the fetal side of the tissue, something called funicitis. And this study by Yamada looked at histological severity of fetal inflammation, asking if is it useful for predicting neonatal uh, outcome. And what they looked at is in 270 placenta, they found that chronic maternal side inflammation was not associated with neurologic injury. However, funicitis or fetal side inflammation, so if the inflammatory markers were on the fetal side of the tissue in the umbilical cord or actually in the fetus, that was what was necessary to be associated with neurologic injury. However, if we want to figure out whether this is actually true, we would need a huge database in order to identify this conclusion of whether or not having bacteria in the uh, uterus or in the chorionic membrane or actually having bacteria in the fetal side of tissue is what's necessary for this outcome. And that database was published in 2015 out of the Swedish registry-based study looking at low APGAR scores, neonatal encephalopathy, and epidural analgesia during labor. And what the authors collected was a 10-year experience of nulliparous patients with a singleton term pregnant uh, patients who were in spontaneous onset of labor, so a fairly cohesive subset of all of their patients. There were overall 300,000 deliveries included. 44% of these women received epidural analgesia. Those who received epidural analgesia were shorter, had higher BMIs, and had larger fetuses. Again, part of the measured and unmeasured factors that can lead to selection bias, right? Here it is, right in print. Similarly, women who received epidural analgesia had dystocia, prolonged labor, more likely to have an instrumental delivery, and more likely to have choriamnionitis and other infections. Again, part of the measured and unmeasured factors that lead to selection bias, right? They had a six-fold higher incidence of maternal fever. This, again, is the association. We know this. Epidural analgesia is associated with more fever in labor. We know that. However, on multivariate analysis, because they did have 300,000 patients, what the authors found was that independently, epidural anesthesia was not associated with neurologic sequela. However, fever independently was associated with both neonatal convulsions at birth and neonatal cerebral ischemia, suggesting that epidural fever does not uh, lead to or cause funicitis, that epidural fever is a benign condition that occurs in women who receive epidurals. Funicitis, however, is a fever, which is a malignant fever, associated with bacteria on the inside of the fetal side tissue, which is associated with neurologic injury. How we can separate or identify those two is not known because our only measurement right now is mom's temperature. Then the other thing that we've been blamed for, of course, is delaying second stage of labor so long that women need to have forceps delivery or or uh, cesarean delivery. So this study was a randomized control trial of bupivacaine and fentanyl versus fentanyl only for epidural analgesia during the second stage of labor. So basically, by taking the bupivacaine out of the epidural solution, moms were then able to have some analgesia with just fentanyl, but no longer had the motor block associated with local anesthetics. Study included 310 nulliparous laboring women, and they were randomized during the second stage of epidural infusion uh, 
As soon as they called second stage, to, to, they were transferred either to maintain the bupivacaine fentanyl uh, epidural infusion or to be converted to a high dose fentanyl, con high concentration fentanyl infusion in order to provide some analgesia. It was done in a blinded fashion. There was no difference in the duration of second stage between the two groups. Similarly, there was no difference in the need for cesarean delivery or the need for forceps uh, at delivery, suggesting that just having weak legs does not mean that you have a weak uterus. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.